Hey, hey, everybody. Hope you're having a great Wednesday. Uh, my name's Dave, and this is Steve Edwards. And Steve, where are you coming to us live from? There's a little bit of a delay there, so uh, he may or may not hear us yeah. right on time. Can you hear me, Steve? Yeah, there we are. Okay. Hey, where are you coming to us from? Uh, <laughs> a place called Vail, Arizona, which is below uh, Tucson, down here at the Andrada Ranch. And... Um, Seeing a longtime friend that I haven't seen in in uh, in a bit, uh, actually about a year, but uh, they're from uh, Texas, and uh, Gio uh, is uh, Gio just just an incredible young man. Uh, I shouldn't say young man; he's about forty nine years old. Everybody's young when you're getting older, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> uh, he's friends with uh, with the. Uh, the manager of this ranch down here, Randy Figgins. And uh, so Randy said, hey, with uh, Gio coming down, why don't you guys come down too and we'll we'll do some things together. So Gio's got three kids, uh, him and Christy. Uh, I met them up at Friendly Pines Camp in Prescott, Arizona. And uh, just, Gio is just incredible. The guy speaks four languages. Now get this, Russian, German, ah, uh, uh, in English, of course, and then uh, uh, French. And and I said, wait a minute, you've been in Arizona all these years, you don't speak Spanish? He said, no, I hadn't had time to learn. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's, that's pretty he's good. That, he's a computer whiz. He's all over the world. Uh, he does a lot of quick book stuff and this sort of thing, but speaks these languages, and he's an incredible kid. I've seen him ride Roman style, riding two horses at one time, uh, and and that was pretty incredible uh, to see that. And plus, it just seemed like everything that he does, it's really unique. But he just does it and goes from there. So today we were uh, back on the ranch, and we need to find this one calf that uh, Randy's wife had saw and thought maybe had a problem. So we were riding around there, and, and darn, when we was riding around there, we found a bull. Uh, uh, F7 bull and darn uh, he's got a broken leg so we took him and uh, and, and pushed him back to the corral house and uh, was going to load him in the trailer and that darn bull turned on me and hit me up against the corral panels and I've been close to a bull but that is way too close he literally right on top of my chest and I'm pounding on his head the guys are hollering at him finally got him off of me and uh, and uh, I think he shortened my size. I feel a little shorter, but praise God, I've got no no broken bones. Everything's in one piece. It works, you know. So, <laughs> I, and and I told him, I said I want a pound of his flesh. So they said, well, all we can do is make hamburger out of him. So we're gonna have some hamburger <laughs> out of Henri Bull, you know. Sorry, that's Jack good. Anyway. That's good. Well, we're glad. Yeah. So when uh, when Steve hopped on, he said I got hit by a bull. I was like, "Are you gonna Are you gonna be okay to do the live stream?" He goes, "Yeah, yeah, I'm all here, all all in one piece." So so Steve is sticking it out for all of us here today, and uh, and it'll be good. So Steve, we've got quite a few folks already hopping on. We got Sundance Kid, we got uh, Astra, we've got a uh, Hondo Hunter, we've got Matt Anderson, Gloria Meyer. Uh, Lori, uh, Lawrence, uh, M.A. Sc uh, Scannell, Pam Costello, Debbie Newby, Celeste Daniels, Bobby Church, uh, David Pingelli, we got wow. uh, D. Witt, Karen Whitford, and Micah Kenny. We got we got the gang here today. How awesome is that? I thought David Pingelli was on his way to Peru. Okay, so <laughs> he just he posted here. Where is it? Hi guys, I'm on a cruise sailing off the coast of Ecuador. And you're coming in loud and clear. Wow. How about that? That's pretty fun. That? Well, that's great. That's and very good. That's good. Well, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do today. I, I'm uh, I like I said, I'm I'm feeling I feel really great, even though that bull ran over top of me. Uh, so man, let's uh, let's help let's help out the mules. I'm sure the people are fine. Uh -huh. Uh, but let's see what we can do to help out the mules. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So, folks, if this is the first time you're hanging out with us or if this is the first time in a long time, there's just a few things 
that we'd like to cover at the very beginning. First and foremost, we want to know if you're watching and where you're watching from. So go ahead, and if you haven't said hello yet in the comments, do that. It's just real important for us to know that, that we're all here together, and it, it's great to see some folks already chiming in, but we want to know that you're here too. So go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section saying where you're watching from. Thank you so much, Nadine, Karen, appreciate that. We want to know that you're here. Uh, the second thing is uh, is we ask that you share this broadcast on your Facebook wall. That's really, if you appreciate these, that is really the best way you can show your appreciation and your gratitude is to share your audience with uh, with this community here that we're putting together. So you just push that little share button down at the bottom of your screen. It's a little arrow that kind of you know, has a curve to it and points out and you just share it to the wall and it says, Hey, do you want to say anything? You just say, Hey, love hanging out with Steve every single, uh, every single Wednesday. You can do that. And then uh, the final thing is we want your questions. This show doesn't happen without those questions that your mule needs answers to, right? The people are fine, but we want to make sure the mules get answers to the questions that they got. So put your, put your questions in the comment section. Um, all questions are valid. All questions are good. You might feel like, Oh, I, you know, they probably already answered this. You know what? New folks are hanging out with us every single week. And all these videos, they go up online onto YouTube as well. And so folks are going to be watching one video. They may not watch another one. So put your question in the comment section and we will get to it. Um, we've got a few more people here. We've got, uh, let's see, Marcus saying uh, hello from Saratoga. Tracy from Lake Como. Uh, David from Australia, though, uh, Let's see. Yeah, David from Australia. We've got Phil Hughes from oh, Nebraska. Did I lose you again? Yeah, you probably lost me. So I need to mention this. So Steve is uh, is remote out there. So he may come in and go out as we go throughout the thing. We'll try and keep him with us as much as possible. We've got a uh, Dory from Virginia. We've got Memory from Oregon. Tammy from Oklahoma, and William from uh, Virginia. So it's good to have all these folks here. Steve, they know you may be coming in. You may be going out. So uh, we're just going to truck along, and we're going to hope that we get some good questions answered here. So um, the first question that we've got here comes from Gloria, and she says, should shoes be pulled off of mules during the winter when they are not being ridden? Another question, we have tried the WD-40 for the flies on the mule le legs. It may work for Arizona flies, but not for Ohio ones. Any other suggestions? Their legs are ate up during the summer. So let's go with the shoe one first. Should the shoes be pulled off? during the winter time when they're not being ridden yes yes and then and then uh comes uh yes they should be pulled off run barefooted but also remember this make sure you trim them keep them as short as possible to keep the snow from balling up and the mud from balling up and this sort of thing but definitely pull them that'd be a good deal and then and then the wd-40 thing i actually have a new product and uh, that I, I I met this lady this last year in Indiana, and I really like it. Uh, and and I've had some other people try it, and I've had some mixed results. Some liked it, some didn't. Here's the thing with this whole thing: flies are going to be there. Period. The best thing you can do is put a fly mask on your mules and let them deal with the flies. Uh, I know they may pester us. But have you ever seen a hide uh, off of a cattle? We, we lost them there. It first. actually weakens the hide. So personally, I don't use any type of fly sprays. The biggest thing you can do with flies on their legs and the biting is to start doing it ahead of time. Uh, this new product, uh, Dave, if you'll help me remember... Uh, I, I meant to bring some with it down here, and I didn't do it. But I'm looking for it right now. I remember you had a picture with her, and I'm trying to find it right now, and I'll put a link yeah. as soon as I do. Yeah. Yeah, we need to – We need to. you know, a lot of people have been using it and have, have liked it. And, folks, this is getting to be fly season right now. So here's the thing. Just take him – don't don't spray the WD-40 all over your animal. Don't do that, okay? Uh, I like to spray it on the tail of my mule so when they're swishing their tails but but really the flies the biggest thing you want to be concerned about is when they're when the mule or the donkey is allergic and they've got it all up and down their legs and around their chest and I, I know people all over the United States has been using the WD-40 
and uh, and and this sort of thing. There's been lots of controversy on it. It's something that I used for years, but I, I've got this new product, and I think probably it would probably be the best way to go at it. Very good. So yeah, I'm looking in. Uh... Folks, we put a lot of awesome stuff on Facebook. So if you're tuning in just for the broadcast, like right now I'm looking and there's a lot of really cool pictures of mules uh, that, that all sorts of uh, folks have sent in from all across the world. But uh, we got a lot of good things that we post up there on Facebook. And one of them is the uh, is this uh, solution that this gal has for sale. I will find it uh, through – I'll keep looking for it throughout the broadcast, see if I can find it and put a link in the show notes. Um, but, uh, but make sure that you're following us on Facebook. The live streams are great, but we're always putting good stuff on there. As a matter of fact, uh, the bit article that we did, that was the first place we, uh, we told folks about it was on Facebook. So, uh, make sure you hop on there and, uh, and, um, follow us on Facebook. Now for folks, we just had about 10 people ju jump on. And so for folks who are just jumping on, uh, welcome. We want to know where you're watching from. Uh, we want to make sure you share this out with your broadcast and then just, Put any comments, questions or comments you have in the comment section. Now, Steve is coming to us uh, remote today, so it, it may drop in. It may drop out here or there. Just know that if, if he goes away for a second, I'm still here, and he'll be right back. Uh, but the next question that we got, Steve, is from Debbie. She says, my mule is so buddy sour that he'll go through the gate or the fence to follow. So I end up ponying him. Any suggestions, hot wire or patience tree? Yeah, you know, hot wires is the best thing. Uh, you know, folks, when some of them can flat be s silly, you know, and and uh, about wanting to be with their buddy, it's not unusual for them to want to be with another equine. We're a predator. There are prey animals, but some are just flat worse than others. Uh, there's no such thing as a training that's going to fix it. This, uh, the training is going to be, as far as the meal goes, the training is going to be to you. How do you fix it? You know. So what I have done in the past is I've had <clears throat> the mule stand in one place and then have other people ride by. And then when the mule looks over toward that other mule that they want to be with, I have them reprimand them. And I have them do that this way. First, I put the mule rider's martingale on them, which sits the head which keeps them from stiffening the neck, necks up, uh, which keeps their mind thinking straight. That mule rider's martingale. We'll just wait for Steve to get back is, here. Is the Let's see if you, you go right, here. left, right. The joys of technology. Don't do that. Listen to me. Listen to me. Come back, listen to me. That's what it's telling the mule. So anytime they're doing something incorrect, either with the halter first, put the come along rope on and go bump, bump, bump with their nose. Or if you're in the saddle, you're going to use your mule rider's martingale, right, left, right, left with your hands and with your legs, you're going to bump them. So in essence, you're saying your attitude is not acceptable. Can you fix Buddy Sour? No because it's naturally ingrained into an equine. They feel safer being with another equine. You, there's not enough riding outside. There's not enough keeping them away from other animals. I've tried all of those. The best thing you can do is for you to have to ride through it. Very good. So hopefully you all got the majority of that. It kind of dropped in, dropped out, but we're going to keep trucking along here. Um, let's see. We got a couple new folks hopping on. We've got Carol from Kansas. Hello. My mule loved his trail rider bit. So that's fun to hear. We love hearing that. Uh, Eileen Easterday from Nebraska. Hi, Eileen. Good to hear from you. Uh, Haley Williams, uh, Nicole, uh, let's see here, Dan and Dory and Kevin and Julie. Oh man, we've got everyone here today. How awesome. Let's see. Yeah. Julie says, I'm new to this. I'm watching from California while I'm bottle feeding the tiny little feral kitten that's in bad shape. Well, I'm glad that that kitten's wow. got you right there taking care of them. That's pretty good. So let's go to the next question here. And, uh, and this one kind of follows up on the, um, on the buddy sour, you know, hopping over. Uh, but this one came from Chrissy and Chrissy's uh, someone who just started uh, following us and kind of 
tracking with what we're doing. So Chrissy, if you're watching, we're really glad uh, to have you be a part. But she says, uh, I love your articles and videos. I'm just now getting into mules. I have a 10 month old Molly mule. I'm having a hell of a time getting her to not jump my gate. She does it when I'm talking to my mare, taking my mare out for trail riding. I have a round pin and some materials to make a small paddock for her. Should I separate her from my horses by herself or can I leave her with my older donkey in a small paddock? I want to make sure I do right with her. I've only dealt with horses. She's my first mule. Thank you so much. Uh, we've actually seen the buddy sour in horses and donkeys and mules. In the equine, that is an equine, and they feel better being all together, safety in a herd. I always, always, always prefer to have my animals separate. Each mule, each donkey in their own separate stalls. That way I can keep an eye on their feed and water and know how healthy they are. A 10-month-old, he's just coming off of mama at six months old, and he's looking for family. So this is the time you need to be the family. Anytime you have one that wants to be a, a fence jumper or something like that, put a hot wire around it. Look, folks, it's the same hot wire like you would use out when you're riding out in the wilderness and you want to set up a hotline to keep from going to it. It simply tells them, when you come up against this corral panel or gate, it's going to make you uncomfortable. And that's, folks, what we have, that's, we have, that's part of being in an equine world, comfortable, uncomfortable. So if they think they're going to be comfortable by bashing a gate, well, when you put up a hot wire, that tells them, don't do that. Very good. So hopefully, Chrissy, hopefully that helps. Uh, let's see here. We got our next question coming in from Celeste. Uh, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Scott and I have been working with our mule. We took her and Joe, my horse, camping this past weekend. When we got ready to leave, I loaded her before Joe. When I turned to look at Scott, she bit me on my shoulder. When we got home, Scott unloaded them. When he was getting her, she got away, turned around in the trailer, and tried kicking him before she jumped out head first. Wow, she was bad. All about being Buddy Sour with Joe. He is halfway through building her stall, thank goodness. Any comments there, Steve? I know that that's probably something other folks have experienced uh, at some point in time here or there. Oh, yeah, and I've experienced it, too. I've been bit, kicked, bucked, you know, I mean, all, all that stuff. It's all part of it, folks. Look, this mule is communicating in equine language. I'm going to bite you because I'm irritated with you, okay? It's the deal of... Asking, telling, demanding. What we probably didn't see to start with was the pinning of the ears. Asking, get out of my sight. You're pestering me. Telling, swishing of the tail, pinning of the ears. Demanding, spin and bite, spin and kick. You know, unfortunately, that type of an attitude, uh, that's when you're going to hear me come on court. Now, you know, everybody says, oh, don't, don't hit that meal. We are you better. You better because you take a, a, a mare that's a that's the herd leader. What does she do? She bites them and she spins and kicks on them. You bet she does. And and with this mule with this this mule biting you, man, I would come uncorked. I would slap with both hands on her belly. I would hoot and holler. No, I wouldn't bang her on the head. You know, I mean, if she went to bite at me, yeah, I'd hit her in the face that way. But you know the. The more yelling and screaming and slapping her on the ribs says, hey, I'm the boss. You're not the boss. Basically, that mule is saying, I am the boss. And uh, it's, it's highly unusual for one to bite and kick. But if you get one that serious, put the come along rope on them every time you work them for the next six months. Remember, six months builds a foundation. Not just a few times, folks. It has to be six months four to six hours a, a week over a six-month time frame. And when this meal comes uncorked like that and goes to bite at you, take a quirk, long sw switch, hit them on the ribs. That's okay because they're the ones that started it. And if you don't show herd leadership, they'll be the ones to finish it. Very good. Hey, real quick, um, was it was it Espana? Was that the product yeah. that we were looking for? Yes, yeah, Espana. I was... I was just trying to come up with that Spanish thought is Spania. That is great. great. Do you remember product. which product in particular it was? I'll put a link, but do you have any idea that she's got a lot of she's got a lot of what appears to be really good stuff. Yeah, it is. And 
and uh, it's a disinfectant. And I, like I said, I got a bottle of it back at the ranch. Is it the all and natural she, bug spray? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, right, and she's also got. You know how the dogs will get into burrs and stuff. She's got a, and and the tails of the mules uh, get burrs and stuff in them. She's mm-hmm. got a detangler as well mm-hmm. that you spray on there, and and that stuff just falls off. But, All right. but I just put a link in the comment section below for folks to go ahead and check out. She's got a lot of really really good stuff. Um, she's got products for uh, equine. She's got products for uh, dogs and cats, and she's got people products too. So she's got a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I actually use that disinfectant on the on the cracks of the heels of my foot, <laughs> and and it worked. <laughs> I I mean, you know, you know how you 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 you're not you don't use any shoes for a bit, and your feet kind of get dry and cracked. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. The tips, the tips of your fingers, the tips of my fingers get all split and cracked at times. I've been spraying that stuff on there, and man, it's been fixing it. It's been That's awesome. awesome stuff. Yeah, Trudy's got That's, some good stuff. We got some cockle burrs out here. And at the Andrada Ranch, they got cockle bear areas, and my border collie is long haired, and he'll get that on him. I'll spray that on on that cockle. His uh, border collie, some cockle burrs right out. Have you? How's Jess doing out there? Oh, Jess is doing good. I wished I had him with me when that bull went and hit me today. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, I went and I put him in the truck. And uh, and we put our mules we put our mules up in the front so we can load the bull in the back and we're going down the alleyway and and uh, Randy just went ahead and turned the bull around he's on foot too and this bull's going by me and usually you can this this bull's a pretty gentle bull but he's got a broken leg and he's just got done walking about three miles on a broken leg and well, we had no choice we're in the middle of nowhere here you know and so anyway that bull turned and hit me. And I mean, kept hitting me, pounding me, and I'm hitting on his head, trying to get him off of me. But I kept thinking, man, I wish I had my dog here. Oh. Jess would have set him straight. Oh, Jess would have, yeah. Jess would have had a hold of his nose, and that bull would have had a lot to worry about. You know? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Hey, so uh, next question that we got here, this is from uh, Nicole. And she says, my mule doesn't like to be in a stall. He rams the door with his body. Tough. That's that's the way life is. Uh, the mule didn't like it the first time you put a saddle on him. The mule didn't like it the first time you put a halter on him. Don't get over it, folks. You know, you you cannot have these animals dictate to you. You have to be the herd leader. Put a hot wire in there, and the mule will get over it. He he will. Every single mule that come to my ranch for training, they go on a ten foot wide, twenty foot deep corral panel. Every one of them, half of that is covered, and they go, every one goes in there, and that each one has its 10 foot by 20 foot pin. Each one does, okay? Now, here's the neat thing about it I can watch the feed, I can watch their water, but listen, when you go to open up the gate, they're right there waiting for you, saying, Oh, I'm glad to see you, I'm tired of being in this small pen, and they'll get over it, all right? They will. Uh, don't don't let these animals dictate to you folks or or, or you could end up in a, in a bad way believe me uh so let's see here we got a couple more folks hanging in here we've got uh jerry uh says thanks for all the good stuff we've got janet from alabama yolanda's here yolanda yes good to have from you here, yolanda she's uh she's fantastic and uh let's see here uh celeste talking about uh the trailer problems said uh lol i did pop the fire out of her (laughs) good for her look folks you can't say oh bad mule don't do that you know what (laughs) you just you just sign your death warrant in so many words or less uh these animals are animals folks and they can take your life out in split seconds it's okay to whack on them because listen they whack on each other it's nothing for a mule to kick another mule. It'd be, it'd be like you and I flipping somebody with a with a finger. But you and I can't take a kick, you know. So get after them. Don't don't let these animals tell you how it is. You need to be the herd leader. Yeah. So one of the things I asked you, I don't know if you remember this, Steve, but um, 
ah, gosh, it probably is three or four years ago now. Um, in a lot of your articles, you say, oh, Fluffy. And in a lot of your videos, you'll go, oh, Fluffy. And I said, I said, was Fluffy ever a real mule? Like, where are you getting Fluffy from? And you said, you said, no, no, I just use the name Fluffy because that's how people treat their mules. Oh, Fluffy, all, you know, like they're pets. And, and you said, they're not, they're, they're not pets. Like, they're awesome animals, but they are dangerous animals and they can hurt you in a heartbeat. Yeah. And, uh, and so I don't, do you remember me asking you that? But, uh, oh, it's yeah. So fluffy. Yeah, you know, folks, they're not your dog and cat. See, the dog and a cat is a predator. So they get along with you just fine. That mule, that donkey, they're on the bottom of the food chain. So think about it. A lion against a person or a mule against me? Uh-uh. You know, what's going to happen is I am going to be the herd leader. And as long as I'm the herd leader, I'm going to be fine. I can't tell you the hundreds of mules that I have handled where people said, this mule won't do something. Well, when they're going, come on, Fluffy, come on, it, it'll be okay. I mean, it's, I know, I know I'm overemphasizing, but when it comes down to these animals, you've got to make them uncomfortable so that they'll listen to you, you know? And believe me, after that, it goes smooth as can be. The little mule I was riding today, nice little mule. And boy, when I first started riding him about, oh, a month or so ago, He'd rear in the air. He'd run backwards. And that was all because of people riding on him that didn't know what to do. And when he did that with me, I jerked a knot in his tail. I went right, left, right, left with my hands. And I hit him with the spurs. And today, this mule was a perfect gentleman. He did everything that I asked him to and never bobbled. Yep, there you go. So let me ask you this. Do... A lot of times we'll talk to our dogs and we'll say, hey, come here, buddy. Come here, buddy. It's okay. It's okay. Can can mules understand that cadence? Like, are they appreciative when we talk sweetly and nicely to them and, and kind of, you know, are are all gentle? Like, do they appreciate that? Does that mean a lot to them? They, You know, they do appreciate it to a point. They really do. They don't understand the words you're saying. The only thing they hear is, yep, 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 yep. They hear the volume of your voice. For instance, on my border collie, if I say, Jess here, or if I'm putting on his collar and he hears the vibrator go off, he hears the vibrator on his collar go off, he comes right to me. Anywhere in the house he's at, if he, he, he's got such good hearing, he does it. Let's go back. They only understand the words because of what? Because of we make them comfortable, uncomfortable. Let me give you an idea. When I'm driving my team, and the team is the most of the time, when you're driving a team is where you're going to do your most, uh, most of your vocabulary. So when you say come ha, huh, that means you're going to be using your reins, and you're going to be pulling on them to bump them, to go to the right or to the left. So when you say, whoa, you pick up on the reins and you pull back, well, pretty soon you can say the word, whoa, and rather than you using the leverage from the line, which gives you a, a lot of pressure, and that bit, you just say the word, whoa, and they'll stop. Or come G, come ha, they'll turn right and they'll turn left. You say, come slow trot, how do they know that? Because when I, when I used a belly slapper on them, uh, that was a deal that went against the belly, and I popped it. I say, I say, slow trot. Well, I made them uncomfortable, and I added the word to it, and boom. Now, can I say side pass, and they'll side pass? No. Side pass, moving to the right. Why are they moving side pass? Because I put a leg on them on the left, and no leg on them on the right, and they go. Comfortable, uncomfortable. But if I say the word side pass, I don't care how many times I have taught them to side pass, they can't pick up the word. But you take meals that do G, ha, whoa, slow trot, they can do that. It's amazing. Let's see here. All right. That's good. I, I appreciate that. I like hearing that and kind of well, knowing. Oh, go ahead. Hey, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, one, one more thing. You know, I had a lady tell me one time, she says, my mule will come to me anytime I call her. I said, oh, really? Okay. Well, ask her to come to you because she went off to the right, you know, and I went off to the left. 
And I said, okay, ask her to come to you. And then I went off to the left, but I went squared shouldered. And I, and I, all I did was kiss at her. And I kissed at her and I squared shouldered. So I was aggressive. The mule focused on me and followed me. It wasn't her saying, come on, come on, come on over here, Jed. Come on, Jed, come on. Jed goes, lo siendo mucho, pero no, I'm, I don't understand you, lady. But when I just clucked at the mule and I squared shoulders, why is that? They read body language. The words don't mean a lot, but the body language. When I get squared up and I looked at him in the eye and I went, the smooching was come to me. And then squared up, said, come over. Now, there's a guy by the name of Hondo online right now that if you think I'm pulling your leg, maybe Hondo can hit a button and say, no, Steve actually showed me that. And that mule got to where that mule followed me anywhere I wanted him to go. And before, Hondo says, you couldn't catch him or touch him or, 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 can, or catch him or touch him. And uh, I was able to show him you could. Very good. That's awesome. I, uh, that's one of the big things. The reason why I like asking that question and like hearing you talk about it is one of the big things for me when I first spent time around mules, around, you know, the mules that you had out on there in the ranch just over 10 years ago was you know, I was looking at them like they were me. I was looking at them like they were human. I was looking at them like I would, you know, interacting with a dog and thinking that the same things that meant well to a dog mean well to mean well to a mule. And what I've just come to learn from all the time we've spent together and everything I've heard is uh, they are their own animal. They were made unique. They were made different. They were created to be the way they are. They're not a clone of this of this other animal. They've got their own temperament. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, they'll yeah. be they'll be subservient to whoever the leader is. Hmm. That's what mules are. If if there's a horse around, that mule will become some subservient to that horse. Let that horse eat all of his feed. Let that horse kick on him, bite on him. Let that horse do all that stuff because they are they are more of a servant mm -hmm. type type animal. But go ahead. So we got a Yolanda. She says she's got a several messages here. She goes, "Hey Steve, I am in, I, Steve and Dave. I have some new astonishing news about my mule." She says it's very important. Remember last week that I thought my mule could have strangles. Well, she doesn't. It's even worse. Let's see. Oh. Where is it, Yolanda? Where's the... Okay. It's even worse. What is it, Yolanda? So we'll come back to that. She'll post it in here. I know she's watching. She'll post it in here and we'll come back to it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Robert has a question. This is a good one. We've never got this one before. We've probably done 25, close to 30 shows and haven't had this one. Any tips for mules around gunfire? Huh. Yeah, don't do it. Uh, I, I know that people like to do this running on horses and shoot balloons and this sort of thing. Um, and, but you know, have I shot around my mules? Yes. Uh, I won't be on their back to pull the trigger because I want a good steady shot. Uh, uh, have I seen them go both ways? I've shot around them uh, a couple times and then shot at them on the third time and I couldn't catch them, so to speak. Uh, so it's not something I like to do. What I usually do, I'll tie my mule up. I'll go into an area. I'll set up my binoculars. I'll set and glass an area. And then I'll pull the trigger from that area. But I try not to shoot within, say, 100 yards of my animals. Good answer. Pretty straightforward. We've got uh, D. Scholl saying, hey, guys. Hey, D. Uh, Tammy saying, I learn every time I tune in. Thank you. We are so glad to hear that. And uh, Mark says, Mark Williams says, I have talked with Mark Miller, and we are planning a couple couple rides. Hi. How awesome is that? Awesome. That's good. That's Connected good. They both them boys are from Virginia. Both of them ride by themselves, and I just happen to get them together. So that's great, you know. It's awesome. Okay, so I le you talk about leadership. The mule's looking for leadership. Eileen asks, does my mule see me as the leader when I chase out deer and coyotes where he is kept? Or is that just kind of silly? Which I think it's a great question. What, what does yeah. that mean to the mule? Does it mean anything? Well, you know, it could very well see that, that these animals are running away from them, you know, and, and that Eileen did the chase in a way that's, I, I've never thought about that, but I don't know why it wouldn't work, but simply because the herd leader, the, the, the head mare 
she chases off the the animals she don't want around. So I guess that's a new thought, Eileen. I think that works. You know, good for you. Very good. So next question that we got here, Robert says thanks much on the uh, on the shooting guns question. So you got it, Robert. So glad that you're here. And if you have any other questions, let us know. Uh, the next question I got, this one came in from Nicole on YouTube. And folks, if you're not following us on YouTube, if you're not watching on YouTube, uh, all the videos we put out there, you sure are missing. We've got some really great stuff up there. I'll put a link in the in the uh, comment section where you can go. Make sure you subscribe. And uh, Steve, I am working. I was testing today. We're not on YouTube Live right now, but I'm working on getting our broadcast live on Facebook and YouTube. So we'll get wow. get to a new audience. We'll see if we can get that going. But um, the question came in from Nicole on YouTube, and she says, I just rescued a seven-month-old mule. He is halter broke, and he has a good disposition, but he kicks a lot. He also rams the gate with his whole body uh, once I put him up the stall. He's restless, finally calms down. I'm working with him daily. Any comments about that situation there? Number one, he needs brain surgery. So in other words, if his testicles are hanging down, get rid of him right away. When you got a young John mule, a young male mule, being a a stud a stallion, they can be hell on and on earth. So strong suggestion: if his testicles are dropped, cut him right away. And then, of course, they pull the wolf teeth at the same time. Anytime you get one that's banging against corrals or pushing gates, hot wire, hot wire, hot wire. And I'm gonna tell you, folks, uh, that hot wire works. My big old draft mules, Tom and Katie, they were out of Shires when. When I would have them out in a grassy area and I'd have a hot wire around them and let them eat grass in the area, my my one mare mule, uh, Kate, Katie, would come up with a whisker on her uh, on her muzzle, and she'd go up and kind of touch it with a whisker, and if she heard the z, then she knew it wasn't on. But if she didn't hear the z, then she'd just walk right through that hot wire. <laughs> she knew how to test that thing. That's very good. So I'm glad we got that. Man, hot wire came up a lot. I don't think I've ever heard you talk about the hot wire on any of these conversations. Then all of a sudden, we've got three questions come up today. It's all about the hot wire. So uh, yeah, when it rains, it pours. Yeah, there's a lot of good ones out there that you can put on a 12-volt a battery or that you can put on a solar system. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways of doing it. I know a, a lot of packers, uh, Eric uh, Lynn from uh, Mountain Gear, he uses them a lot with his donkeys. Uh, I personally have never used them. I've always hobbled my animals out uh, uh, for for feeding and grazing. I do not hobble with front feet, by the way. I either, I either hobble left front, right rear together, so they have to scoot, or I hobble a right rear leg. And usually what I do is I'll take the herd leader, and I'll hobble a her or him up, and I'll turn the rest of the animals loose. And and we did that a, a lot, especially at Yosemite, we did that. So a lot of, whenever we bring up Eric, uh, it reminds me, a lot of folks love those original ATV hats. Those are pretty yeah. cool. Um, so uh, I've just put a link in the comment section where folks can go check out. Eric's got great stuff. He's got great packing gear. Um, really does a lot of awesome work with donkeys. He's got some mules too. I know we're pl trying to get him down to the ranch and uh and do some work down at uh queen valley mule ranch with them but uh i put a link you can go check out all of his gear at mountainridgegear.com and uh you can get uh, uh, a couple of those original atv hats too we'll get those out and about um so uh yolanda just came in and here's what she had to say when i called steve she was slow in movement and eating and that became worse and worse and on friday she stopped eating her hay and that worried me more and more so i kept her indoors Monday, the vet came to draw blood because it could it could be heartworms or other worms you will not find in the manure, and she got worse and worse, sleeping a lot, no more energy, so the vet called today with the results, and the worms, uh, worms okay, manure okay, but her blood was not good. Turned out her red blood cells dropped so much, she is now on the brink of a blood transfusion. It turned out she was poisoned. Oh, no. Oh, that's horrible. It's awful. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, get the lynching party out. Let's go find this. That's ridiculous. Oh yeah. my. Now, now was it was it possum poisoning? You know, possums they 
they urinate on food and this sort of thing, and you can get a, a poisoning from that. But or was it poison from a, from a person? Oh my so goodness! Here's what she says. She she says. She's poisoned with soy scrap, and it's modified soy oil that they put here in this country in all horse feed and even more in donkey feeds. It almost killed her, but she is not out of the woods yet. I'm glad she found out. I mean, it sounds like it was Uh a mystery, 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 and then she finds out. But uh, one of the things that I love about you, Yolanda, one of the things that we appreciate is out there in the Netherlands, you, you are the lone ambassador, right? You're yeah. the one out there who there, there's not a lot of folks who understand the mule and the donkey out there. And folks, if you don't know Yolanda, she is working really hard to be a good ambassador for the mule and the donkey in the Netherlands. And uh, and we're real proud of her. We're real proud of what she does. And we're real grateful that she hangs out with us here every week. But that's just awful. And uh, I'm glad that you were able to identify it. And please do keep us up to date with how, how it's going. Yeah, and a suggestion might be there, folks. Anytime you have your animals low in your blood count and this sort of thing, I like to use red sale, red sale. And you can buy it in gallon jugs and you can put it in with the sweet feed and this sort of thing. And I've had animals at different times to where uh, they kind of get overworked uh, and and you don't really realize it to the last minute. They kind of get overworked and then that red sale starts starts, uh, uh, replenishing their their uh their blood and and getting them getting them giving them some uh energy so you might want to consider that but you want to keep us uh in uh going there and that soybean i've heard that before now that i think about it something about the soybean uh, especially if they do it in a powder form but i don't recall anything right now so um let's let's keep going with uh with nutrition here. I got Allison on YouTube. Um she asked the question other than the rem- she says a uh, horse ingested uh cheat grass foxtail other than removing the hay what can you do to help horse help a horse who has ingested the cheat grass or foxtail? Oh my goodness. Well, the best thing you can do is is get them to a vet and have them uh run the uh linseed the the oil in i said linseed oil it's not right but have them run oil in their system to oil things up and have it pass out that foxtail is a horrible thing it can get caught in in the uh, intestines it can get caught in the throat it's really bad and the only thing you can really do is uh to take them to the vet and have them run a tube down their nose and have them oil them up with some antibiotics as well as the oil um that's something to really watch, folks, is watch your feed. Uh, the, you know, just because it's supposed to be uh, uh, all Bermuda hay or something like that, you know, look through it. Uh, they can be something like a blister beetle. Colorado is really bad about a blister beetle and other things. But uh, that's why I prefer, Dave, and you know it, that's why, folks, I prefer a pelleted feed. It's clean. It's got all the vitamins and minerals in it. And, and and I, I cannot tell you this is going to it's going to scare a lot of people, and blow your mind. But look, there is in this hay, there is lots of salmonella problems. A lot of what people think is colic, what the veterinarians think is colic, can be salmonella poisoning. And and we we get that in the hay. You think of all the rats and rat poop and bird poop and and snake parts and whatever rat parts salmonella poisoning is very prevalent in hay and you know a cow's not so bad she's got seven stomachs but a an equine is not and that's why i prefer feeding a pelleted hay it's all the bad stuff is cooked out they have the vitamins and minerals that your equine needs and if you're not sure of what vitamins and minerals your equine needs, get a hold of the vet, have them do some testing, and see what it is. Like some, I'm going to tell you, the majority of mules and donkeys out there are zinc uh, short. They don't have enough zinc in their body to, to maintain things. And that's probably one of the biggest problems. But that's, I, I feed a pellet. I do not feed any hay at all. I haven't had hay on my place for 15 years unless somebody brought it for their equine for a changeover, and eventually I'll have them to a pellet. But does it uh, take a lot of foxtail in the hay to wind up clogging them up, or does it just take a little? 
But it, it only takes a couple to make them uncomfortable. I mean, they're so un, uncomfortable, you can't hardly even ride them because they're just, they just, it, it's fidgety and moving around and they're trying to get things together. Um, you know, that foxtail, and they can even pick that up out there in the fields when they're out there in the pastures eating it, if, if they can pick it up. You know, foxtail is a horrible thing. Um, so now that we're kind of talking a little bit about feed, so Yolanda comes back, she says, uh, her mule is now on alfalfa hay and grains like corn, barley, oats spelled. Uh, and she is even now on a very special clay from deep in the mountains of Switzerland that is very rich in minerals, uh, vitamins and other stuff she needs. Uh, tomorrow I can pick up red cell because the vet was out of it today. Um, so yeah, keep us in the, oh, and she says, uh, she says, we do not have possums and snakes here. So I guess that's good. <laughs> there you go. Good deal. All right. Um, so, well, uh, oh, go ahead. She's also talking about a, a lot of high carbohydrates there and, and the mule probably needs it right now, but, uh, sure be careful. Cause when you start feeding a lot of <coughs> alfalfa hay and other high, high carbohydrates, you're your uh, grains and this sort of thing, uh, they can develop uh, what's called grass founder, and that's where the top of the neck becomes hard and crusty along the top of the ribs as well. So you kind of got one of them dang if you do, dang if you don't. You need that kind of feed to get her well, but once she gets going, always, folks, make sure they're on good, clean water and salt. You do not need the mineral salt. You're wasting your money with mineral salt. You know, they... Uh, they may not need the minerals for their system as they do for another system of an animal. Just buy a good, you know, have good clean water and and buy a good feed. That's that's the best thing you can do. Um, so uh, thank you for that. So we've got uh, Tracy McKinnon here. Good morning from Queensland, Australia. Thanks for the live stream. Greatly appreciated. You're very welcome, Tracy. We're glad you're here. Uh, we've got Jack Mitch saying hello, and we've got yeah. uh, Linda Linda Dickman, and Linda informed me this week that she goes by the name Twig. So we've got Twig here joining us today. So it's good to have you here, Twig. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, okay, another question about feed, and this one is from, let me see here. Uh, it was just here. Uh, Karen Whitford says, what is your favorite feed for donkeys? So you talked about the pellets. Are the pellets just as good for the donkey as they are for the mule? Absolutely, especially especially for the donkey, folks. If you've seen wild donkeys as I've seen them out here, and seen them uh, where they you know where they they could pretty much rummage you know, and everything, uh, you get some of them that get into this feed that's rich in, in carbohydrates and uh, and not enough protein. Oh my goodness, the fat pockets are heavy. Their feet contract really bad. So, you know, my article, Mules Can't Stand Prosperity. Folks, if you want to read an article that's going to help you out with your feed, and at the end it has ingredients, and that ingredients uh, tells you everything that you that I found works good for the mules and the donkeys. And, and folks, it's also going to remind yourself, too, about this. It's also going to depend on the type of work that these animals have. If they're just standing around, they don't need a lot of hot feed. All it's going to do is make them silly and could even give them founder. I just uh, I just put a link uh, to Mules Can't Stand Prosperity in the comment section. Folks, get on that article. Um, we do a bunch of questions here, but all throughout the week, uh, Steve and I are answering questions uh, to emails that come in, Facebook comments, Facebook messages. And one of the articles that we send folks more than any other is the Mules Can't Stand Prosperity. In addition to that, there's a link to a free video Steve did all about Lake and Light, all about uh, nutrition program. You can get that. Uh, that is uh, one. All we ask is that you just tell us where you want us to send the video. Um, so you can get those both um, in the comment section there. If you're just joining us, Welcome. We're so glad that you're here, Steve and I. Uh, my name is Dave, and this is Steve Edwards, and we come and do a, a, a live clinic, a live mule and donkey clinic, uh, Q&A, every single Wednesday, typically around 2.30 Pacific Daylight Time, and so that's what we're doing right now. Steve's coming to us from, uh, tell me again where you're coming from, Steve? It's Vail, Arizona, which is about an hour from uh, Tucson, roughly. Uh, it's right around Patagonia, uh, probably about uh, about an hour or so from Benson, and 
uh, and and it's in the it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's Andrea Andrea Ranch, and it used to be part of uh, of a mega ranch down here, and I lost the name of it. oh the Empire Ranch. It used to be uh, in the corner, the uh, northwest corner of the Empire Ranch, and uh, and it ended up getting sold off in pieces and. And then the main part of the headquarters of the uh, uh, Andrada Ranch is uh, uh, is managed by Randy Figgins here. And if the holding company is a um, a big farm in uh, in West Fe- in West Phoenix. Very good. So that's where Steve's coming from. And we've actually had really good connection here for the last 15, 20 minutes. So hopefully yeah. for the last 10 minutes, we'll still have a great connection. If uh, if you're just joining us. Uh, there's only a couple things that we ask. Number one, let us know that you're here. Share your name. Uh, well, your name will pop up when you share, share a comment, but share where you're watching from in the comment section. The other thing is that we ask you share the broadcast, and I just put a uh, link to a picture in the comment section. If you're watching from a phone, that shows you how to share the broadcast, um, and that will allow us to get this clinic out in front of more and more people so that they their mules get the answers that they need, right? The people are doing all right. We just want to make sure that the mules get the answer that they need. And then uh, any comments that you have, uh, whether you think we've answered it already, whether we've answered it in the past, or you, or you feel like, ah, I don't know if that's a good question. Folks, we want all your questions. The, whole, the, the thing that Steve has said and, and that I love about doing these is that uh, as long as God gives Steve breath, he's going to talk to people about the mule and the donkey and make sure we get all of the information out there so that when the day goes that Steve's no longer here and he's with Jesus, YouTube uh-huh. continues to preach what the mule and the donkey mean. Uh-huh. We're going to let mute YouTube carry the, uh, carry the torch here after we're gone. But, uh, but leave your comment section below. And so the next question that I got, Steve, is uh, this one's from Deborah, and it comes from YouTube as well. And uh, it's about starting under sa- saddle. Uh, Deborah says, how do I know when my mule is big enough to start under sa- sandal? start under saddle. She is fine bone. She's now three and still very narrow. Her feet are the size of a yearling quarter horse foot. Looking at her confirmation, I would guess her mother was cutting uh, cutting bread. Her feet don't look very donkey-like, more horse-like, uh, wants to grow too much toe. She turns through herself on a dime, pretty lope and trot. She is very feely, soft in the face. I can trim her feet in the stall with no halter. Still working on leading in the open. I'm in no hurry. I'm 5'6", 56 years old, 180 pounds. Spent years starting colts for show, uh, but this is a whole different rodeo. I'm trying to go into this with no expectations. Don't want to hurt her. Uh, she uh, rescued her at nine months old. Uh, my big concern is not hurting her bones. What do you have to say there? That's a pretty detailed question. What, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and it's you know it's basically what any of us horsemen, uh, meal people, and this sort of thing need to understand. You know, the biggest thing we need to be concerned about is the cartilage in the knees. Cartilage in the knees. In order for that animal to to rightly move, that has to move in there smooth and easy, nice and quiet. When we ride them too young, we pound on that cartilage and we end up crippling them. And here's the downside, folks, is these animals don't really realize pain. They don't show it like they're very stoic until it's too late, folks. Uh, And so there's, I personally, when I can look at a knee and I can see the hair growing in the knee straight and it's nice and straight coming across, it's all one color as far as the hair goes. There's not a lot of light and the dark goes. That tells me that the knee, the cartilage, is usually closing over. How do I know for sure? Take it to a veterinarian, have them run the scope on it, have them look at it, make sure it's a good, solid, solid knee. Now, remember, too, they have got seven years of growth. So three years old is just starting to get their growth. The harder you ride them, the harder it's going to be on their bones, you know. So you make sure that... uh, that your you know your writing is is good quality writing, and what I mean by that is it don't have to be an hour or two hours. If if you just within a ten foot circle, uh, side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hindquarters, uh, is is great. I do very very little cantering, uh, very very little uh, extended trots with my colts. Uh, I usually like to wait till they're 
oh, a good uh, five years old before I'm really doing uh, some loafing, some circles. Uh, and that way I can make sure that muscle is there with the bone and, and to help it out. And that's really important. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just writing that down because that's good. Uh, so it seems like there's a lot of questions folks have about the appropriate ages uh, to do different things with uh, with mules, colts, things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm always appreciative when we get those questions come in because I, I think it answers a lot of questions. Folks really want to do right by their mules, um, yeah. and uh, and we applaud them for that. So here's another one. We just I actually asked this question. Um, we just produced an article on um, on bits, and I'll put it, it's it's a fantastic article. I just added a bunch of pictures, and uh, and folks, if you have questions about bits. Um, one, they are super, super duper important. It's not just something, what I've learned from Steve is it's not just something you, oh, this is the pretty one. Oh, this looks nice. Um, oh, I, th you know, this, this looks about what I need. No, like you need to have the right bit for the right job. And the right bit is the right bit for the mule, not a horse bit, not anything that just looks nice and fancy. So Steve was very, very uh, clear with me when we were putting this article together. So I'll put a link there. But one of the thing, one of the pictures you sent me was for a uh, Bosol. Is that how you say it, Bosol? Yeah, Bosal, Bosales, Bo yeah. Bosal. Yeah. I just wanted to know. Can you share a little bit about what they are and uh, and if we should be using them with our mules and our donkeys? Yeah, actually, you know, when it comes down to a Bosal, uh, it's uh, it's they use the original ones used a rawhide core and it was kind of teardrop in color or teardrop in shape. And I think we got a picture of that on the article as well. And then they braid rawhide over top of it. Mine, uh, all of my uh, bozales are made from uh, Nick West from Alberta, Canada, who's now gone home to be with the Lord. And he handmade each one of these. He called them nose bands. And basically, that's what it means in, in Spanish. Bozales is, is, uh, is nose band. And anyway... So it's it's mules care more about their nose than they do the mouth. But here's the downside, folks, is if it's not used correctly, you can cause more problems with the bozales than you can uh, with your bit. Uh, and, and when I say that, there's a lot of nerves up underneath here that can be killed. There's a lot of nerves across the top of the bridge of the nose that can be killed. Uh, I watched a lady today when we were we was moving this bull back. And some local neighbors was riding, and uh, they had one of them had a mechanical hackamore on, and and instead of the uh, shanks hanging straight down, she's riding this horse, and the horse has got his nose in the air trying to protect himself. She's holding on to the reins, and the uh, shanks are pointing back this way, not doing a bit of good. If she needed to stop that horse, she couldn't do it. So going back to this, uh, a bozal is a wonderful tool in the right hands, uh, and, and that's that's really important to consider. So would I have would I have most? Well, let me just put it to you like this: I've only got two of my apprentices ever in the past forty years uh, that I felt had good enough hands that could use a bozal that did the mule justice uh you're far better off uh with my mule riders martingale uh the bozell i can tell you there was a time when i could not show my mules in a bozell i would try to be in a western pleasure class or or a, a trail class and when i would come up with my bozell the judge would say i'm sorry we're not going to use that harsh uh uh equipment on, on, on our programs and would tell me to leave. Well, today it's chic to have a Bozell, even though I've seen very, very few people use them correctly. So it's, it's a wonderful tool, uh, just like anything else if it's used correctly. Very good. So we've got uh, Gary Green from Tularosa, New Mexico listening. Hello, Gary. We've got uh, Jeffrey. We've got uh, Dana. Uh, we've got Cindy. We've got uh, quite a few more folks hopping in here. So we're glad to have you guys. And you know what, Steve, is it okay? Do you have a hard cut? Do we have a few extra minutes? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, and Gary Green, by the way, uh, yeah. he comes from Nebraska down to New Mexico. Got a really nice donkey. 
and he was afraid of doing them him doing the donkey roan and not knowing what to do but yet he had a cowboy riding his donkey he sent me some videos and it was horrible it was i it was i, I don't want to go into it deep but what he was doing to that poor donkey yes he was mr green was right he was riding the donkey but was he he was creating more problems with that donkey by using a big heavy shank bit instead of a snaffle he was he had the saddle too far forward i can go on and on and on and on and on folks you know not to pat myself on the back now get this on your on your mind but there's a lot of you who have got my dvds who have fixed the problem yourself i didn't do it a quote professional didn't do it you did it by just following some simple instructions. And Dave, you know as well as I do, that's, that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I want people to see you don't have to be a, quote, professional trainer to train your mule and donkey. You bought them to enjoy, enjoy them. Take your time. Get a little at a time. Enjoy being with them. The writing part will come soon enough. Yeah. Yep. That's why we're here. Uh, let's see here. Diane uh, from North Carolina just said hello. Diane, it's good to have you here. We're going to go over a little bit, folks, because we've got a couple more questions that we want to an uh, answer. So if you have any final questions, put them in there. We'll make sure to get to them today. Uh, the next question, this one's come from Jeffrey, and I'm interested to hear what you have to say. So mules versus hennies and why. So first, can you tell me what the difference is, and then can you answer the question mules versus hennies and why? <coughs> okay. <clears throat> So to have a mule, you have a mare horse and a jack donkey. So a stud donkey and a mare horse creates your mule. To create a henny is a donkey being the mother, father being the horse. That's how you have a henny. You cannot put the two together and say the one on the right is is uh is a henny and the one on the left is a mule 99.9.9 .9 percent .9 of the time you are going to be wrong the only way you can tell it's a henny or if it's a mule in other words if the mother was a horse or if the mother was a donkey is dna testing i have i have showed people time and time again they knew the breeding of each one of the animals. Each one of the people had their own breeding. So I knew we had a henny. We knew we had a mule. And I have used those in clinics. And I wished I would have videoed it to this day. But you can look at those two and swear them down. They were both mules. Or you look at them and say, oh, well, the one's got smaller ears. No, no, no. One's got a smaller head. No, no, no. Has nothing to do with any of that. The only way you can tell is DNA testing is the only way. Now, when it comes down to training, I've trained a few of them over the years. They haven't been as popular as they are now. Uh, I really didn't see a whole lot of difference. Uh, maybe the one henny that I was riding may not have been a, as strong-minded, uh, but I really didn't see much difference when it comes down to training. So it really is just personal preference, I guess? Well, it's something, you know, we, we all like to... We all like to uh, think we've got something different than, mm -hmm. than everybody else. You know, uh, I've got a Ford and you've got a Chevy, you know, type thing. But it's, it's, it's not really a person. It just happens to be the way it is. There, I cannot tell you that one's better than the other, you know, yeah. by any means. I, the ones that I've trained on, uh, I've been happy with and they've turned out fine. But DNA testing is the only way you're going to be able to tell. Other than that, it's just somebody saying, hey, I've got something different than you, you know? Yeah. Well, you say Ford, you say Chevy. You've got neither. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how long have you been driving Dodge? Oh, well, I've been driving Dodge now for since 1991. 92, pardon me. Um, and the only reason I did that is my 72 Ford truck, which I bought brand new in 1972 for $4,089, tax license and all. I decided if I'm going to spend $4,000 for a truck, I'm going to drive that truck the rest of my life. So in 1972, I bought it right off the assembly line from the dealership that I was working for at that time. And I drove that truck over 20 years. 
And finally, in 1991, on my way to Bishop World Championships, I was pulling a 40-foot trailer loaded with mules and gear, and we were going there to train, I mean, to, to uh, compete in, in 1991. And I blew the motor and uh, uh, in, my, in my Ford truck. And so my wife says, we're going to get a new vehicle. And I said, no, nah, it's going to be awful expensive. She says, no, we're going to get another vehicle. So we did. We bought a 92 Dodge. And I've been driving Dodges ever since, mainly because of that Cummins. That Cummins is one tough uh, motor, and that's what I've got in my 2015 uh, one-ton Dodge. There you go. Uh, let's see here. Uh, next question. This one, I think we've got two or three left here. This one's from Dana. Dana says it's Texas storm season. Last week we had a hailstorm, and the girls stood in the pasture getting hit. They have a barn and plenty of options. A few days later, we had a tornado warning. They did get in the barn then. Do you recommend locking them up or leaving them free to make their own decision? I felt so bad for them getting beaten by the hail. I, re I recommend locking them up. Uh, I've, I've known of these animals uh, getting hit in the eye and put out an eye. Uh, and that's about the worst that I've heard. Uh, you know, they can take a lot more uh, pain than we can, but... Put them in the barn and lock them up. You know, that's about the best you can do. Uh, Yolanda says, if uh, if I need to give my mule a blood transfusion, do I need another mule for that? You ever you ever dealt with that, Steve? You ever had that come across your path? I've, I've never heard about, I've heard of them giving some blood, but for the most part, uh, not a transfusion. Um, that's completely new to me. I've, that's a new one on me. Yeah, it and makes sure it. You have to use another animal's blood for sure, and you have to make sure, just like anything else, if it's going to be positive or negative or whatever. That's a new one on me, Dave. Yeah, well, it just underscores the importance of having a good vet that you trust that understands the mule and the donkey. Yep. Yeah, and that's um, the problem. We 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 don't have enough vets doing that. Uh, so Sherry Lewis says, "I'm listening on my way home from work in Pensacola, Pensacola Florida." Thanks for sharing your knowledge on mules, especially donkeys. Well, you're absolutely welcome, Sherry. We're so grateful uh, that you're hanging out with us and uh, and and glad to do it. Uh, Eileen says that she's still learning from your DVD set, so we love hearing that, Eileen. Thank you. And uh, let's see here. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, on his question of the mules and the hennies, he said, thanks for the answer. I was wondering about their brains and athletic abilities, and you answered that. So that's very good. Good. All right, so we have come to the final question of the show. Uh, so Nicole asks, at what age can my mule pull heavier weights? My John is pulling tires and small logs, but wondering when he can start with heavier things. Also, can mules be happy being the only equine? I always felt they needed a companion, but lately I've had a couple people telling me that they can have happy. They can be happy by themselves if you spend enough time with them. So two questions there: pulling heavier weights. When can they do that? And then. Should they have a buddy? Do they need a pal? Uh, you always want to work out, to, you know, slowly, just like you and I working out for for uh, muscle and this sort of thing um, and for, for cardio. Uh, so always go slow. you got to remember they're growing a bone until they're seven years old. That's that's super important. Uh, but it just just take your time. Uh, always watch their their temperature gauge. Now, here's the temperature gauge, and I don't know if you remember this, Dave. Right at the bottom of the ears, right where the ears are meeting the skull, when you start seeing sweat there, they are starting to overheat. And it's time to give them a break, get off, lift up the back of the saddle, let the cool air go through. But when you start seeing that, that about a half an inch in the bottom of the ears and the skull, that right there is when that animal's starting to overheat. Yep, and that's something that we spoke a lot about last year, was a lot about uh, monitoring your mule's temperature, monitoring and making sure they get the rest, and then uh, un undoing the britching and the back cinch and uh, flapping up and down on the uh, on the uh, the back of the saddle, allow that airflow up in there. It uh, was yep. something that it seemed like we talked about it just about every week last year. Yeah, especially during the summertime. What was the second part to that question? Uh, the, the second part to the question was the companionship. She's oh, been yeah. told that they got to have a companion. No, they don't. You know, here, here, let me tell you, folks. I know people that have bought a companion goat so that the horse would have the goat. Now the horse can't go anywhere unless he's got the goat with him. You know, 
these people just they say the the horse, the mule, the donkey just absolutely goes goes berserk when they're companion animal. You be the companion, you know, and you don't have to spend a ton of time with them. You know, it ain't like you know when you go out to feed them. You know, take a few minutes before you feed them, take them out, brush them, pick up their feet and things like that. A few minutes each day is a lot, you know, uh, but they need to, they need you. They don't need another animal. You will get to where <coughs> you can't hardly handle them. And I did that at Pierce College uh, back when I did that program in, in, uh, in the 2000. And I showed uh, uh, everyone how... Uh, see, that was about 2006, and I showed I showed my students how. Okay, let's take your animals. They want to turn them out in the uh, in the big arena over the weekend while they uh, before they when they, while they were gone for the weekend. So we did. We turned them all out, uh, and we had a couple people coming over and feeding them in the in the mornings and the afternoons and this sort of thing. They turned them out over the weekend. Guess what, Dave? It took them almost a week to start getting those mules' minds back again and those donkeys' minds back again because they had gotten to spend a lot of time with their buddies and they didn't want to leave their buddies. They didn't want to listen to you. They didn't need anything out there. They had their food, their water, their buddies. They didn't need you. But when they're in a small pen, folks, they need you. They need you to get them, get them out. They need you to, to, to spend time with them, brush them and stuff. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, they're awesome animals. They make great companions. And you know what? There's so many folks, and, and, uh, and we hear this, folks have always wanted to have an equine. And a lot of times the horse is the one that they kind of set their sights on. But when push comes to st shove, and I I've heard this so many times from people, when push comes to shove and they start looking at what equine is going to be right for them, they keep getting drawn to the mule and the donkey. And the donkey has started to really come on here in the last five years. But the more folks learn and are educated, they discover that the animal that they really want isn't isn't a horse. They're really looking for the mule or the donkey, and uh, and they're they're awesome animals. Yeah, and and you know, folks are always asking me where to go get donkeys. I'm telling you, the place to get donkeys these days is over here at the federal prison, uh, about 25 miles from my ranch, uh, and and uh, it's it's they've got a a, a wild horse. And wild donkey program, and let me tell you, they got some donkeys over there that are good looking donkeys. I mean, class looking donkeys, a variety of sizes, and you can go over there. We got two of them here at the ranch, at the Andrada Ranch, right now. Randy, who is the manager of the ranch, he went over and uh, and seen Randy Helms. Randy's a good friend of mine, good horseman, and this sort of thing, and they're training. These horses and these donkeys over there at, at the Florence prison system. And here's the thing. Uh, you can buy a horse that's got 90 days of training on him, ready to go for $600. Wow. $400. You can buy a donkey that's pulling a cart and riding. 400 bucks. Wow. What a deal. Look, folks, uh, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> Dave, we need to get that information on the website and get connected with Randy so that people understand that that's a good place to go to get a good animal. Yeah, we'll take care of it. Um, well, folks, oh, uh, Yolanda wanted me to say, Steve, my PayPal is finally working, so that's good stuff. If if, if y'all need anything, we're just here to give out the information, but uh, a lot of times the best way to uh, – the best way to execute and get the, the changes is to invest in some equipment, invest in some training. If you need anything from Steve's website, you can go to muleranch.com. It's there for when you need it. We'll recommend free stuff. We'll recommend paid stuff. But the overall arching thing here is we just want to help you. And a lot of times uh, you need the right equipment. And then there's a lot of times where you just need a little bit of special attention. Um, let's see. Uh, Yolanda says she got her PayPal working. And then she goes, Dave, the word on Chebec however it is you speak it as on on bite cook on bite cook on bite cook that was the uh that was the bread cake that we talked about last week you remember that i haven't tasted it yet but i can't wait for yolanda to send it to me i know right uh let's <laughs> see uh eileen we appreciate your live stream today eileen absolutely steve do you have any final words 
Well, yeah, you know, that I think that cake would really taste good with my come along coffee. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so the come along coffee is going to be coming out um probably have you heard back Carlos on the shipping yet? Okay, we just got the information on the shipping. My team is getting it up on the website. We're going to have come along coffee out here before the end of the week. You can go to muleranch.com. You can get everything your mule could ever need and a cup of coffee for yourself to start the day off. That's right. The ask, tell, demand coffee. So <laughs> That's you, right. You can, you can either have the weaker coffee or the stronger coffee. But it's going to be fun. To, it's going to be fun. Isn't that, Dave? You know, it's going to be awesome. Tell, demand coffee. Yep. Yeah. There we go. It's awesome. Yolanda says she's going to send us some stuff. Yolanda, we'll look forward to it. Folks, thank you so much. My name's Dave. This is Steve Edwards. Uh, please, if you have not already, go ahead and share the broadcast uh, with friends, with family, just by clicking the share button below. John, we're so glad that you're hanging out here at the very last. Uh, thank you for the information. He says, it's our pleasure. And uh, thank you so much, folks. We will see you next week. Steve, until next hey, week, Dave. all right? Can yeah. everybody see what I'm doing with the camera right now? You know what? You're moving the camera, and I just realized we had we had your computer camera going, not the uh, not the special oh. camera that I sent you. So slide oh. your computer over there. Oh, okay. So here's here come here comes, folks. This is what I'm looking at right now. There you go. Right there. Can you see my Dodge truck? And then there Randy's is. Randy Chevy over there. But look at all that country. That's the Andrada Ranch. That's where I'm at right now. And you talk about some class cattle. Man, these things are well-bred. I mean, that's pretty neat. But anyway, here we are. And uh, if some of you folks didn't hear it before, uh, I got ran over by a bull today. He pinned me 2,000 pounds worth of bull. So Steve's computer is connected We're off and to... running. There he goes. Awesome. Steve's out there suffering for all of us. We'll let him get back to that. We're glad to give him a repeat, reprieve here for a little bit. Folks, thanks so much for hanging out. Share the broadcast. We will see you next week. God bless. See y'all later.